Good afternoon and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Neil Clark, Extension Forester for Southeast Virginia. Today's uh, topic is the S-curve of uh, forest carbon. And without getting into all of the uh, nuances and uh, political elements of, uh, of climate change, uh, we're just going to say that um, a global issue that we're dealing with is the carbon balance between uh, terrestrial carbon and uh, of course large amounts that are that are being released into the atmosphere uh, as CO2 or carbon dioxide. So um, you know we can we can know and measure that uh, that a large amount of um, carbon is being released uh, by various means. At the same time, uh, we can measure ways that carbon is being uh, captured or sequestered. In this video, I'll use the term sequestered uh, a bit. Uh, just means carbon is being captured, um, and in this case, by biological uh, organisms known as trees or plants. So it's generally agreed upon um, that due to the extent uh, of forest uh, across the global landscape uh, that forests can and do play a large part in, uh, in carbon capture. So in this video we're going to touch on the basics of, of how that happens and how our management practices may enhance uh, what forests already do. So currently in the U.S. Uh, forests uh, sequester enough carbon to offset about 15% of our emissions. Um, however, um, it is estimated that changing our management techniques, we may be able to sequester another 150 uh, million tons of uh, carbon per year uh, through forests. So you guessed it, trees as well as other green plants uh, sequester carbon through photosynthesis. Remember the fourth grade? So with photosynthesis in your leaf, you have your carbon dioxide which enters the leaf, uh, CO2, and then you have O2, your oxygen which leaves the leaf. Um, so the question is, what happened to that carbon? And the answer is it becomes part of the uh, sugar molecule and those sugars then go and combine uh, in the rest of the uh, cellular process uh, into many things but uh, one of those being uh, cellulose and cellulose is probably the most abundant organic compound uh, on earth. <clears throat> the proportion of wood that is carbon uh, of oven dried wood is about 50 percent and the proportion of uh, stand wood standing in a tree um, uh, is about 50 percent uh, of, of green wood. So the amount of carbon uh, tonnage uh, in a general uh, ton of wood would be about 25 percent would be carbon. So the parts of the tree obviously that uh, contain cellulose would be the bark, uh, the wood under the bark, all the wood, uh, the leaves, and in that uh, components and then of course many underground components uh, also uh, fallen leaves fallen leaves fallen twigs and of course all the un underground components the uh, roots that are under the ground uh, the dead roots uh, and then all the biota uh, that decompose those dead roots and all so this is easier uh, conceptualized than than actually uh, executed on the ground. On paper you can plant an infinite number of trees on an infinite number of acres at a fixed price. In real life uh, there's a fixed amount of arable acres that we can actually uh, grow trees and in certain areas uh, there's high competition for the land use uh, of those acres. So um, you know first we need to we need to feed ourselves, feed the world. Uh, then we need to uh, have products so we can have homes and, uh, and places to live. Uh, and then we may want other fiber and other wood products. Um, and then with carbon, we can uh, co-mingle those goods uh, and have carbon storage and wood products combination. And then there may be some areas where 
uh, we can set aside uh, just to have trees for carbon storage. Uh, it's more than likely that they will have other ecosystem benefits, uh, wildlife, uh, clean water, uh, clean air, and other uh, benefits such as that while it is sequestering uh, carbon over a longer time frame. Then someone will say, well, let's plant trees. So the question is, which ones? If we plant a million dogwood trees, um, they obviously will only achieve a height of about 20 feet. And it will do so at a very slow rate uh, and four inches in diameter and then uh, have about a 30 year lifespan and, and, and then die. And then it doesn't give us really uh, what we're looking for in the way of rate of carbon capture uh, or uh, duration of carbon storage after that. So those are two concepts that we want to look at uh, when we talk about uh, forest, uh, forest as sinks for carbon uh, is the rate of capture um, and the ability to store that uh, long term. So uh, if we look at two species we're very familiar with in Virginia, uh, we look at uh, pine trees. Pine trees are early successional trees and they're, uh, if you look at their growth curve, so their S curve that I'll talk about here in a minute, um, they, will, they can capture um, carbon at a much faster rate uh, than say uh, an oak tree can. However, when it comes to long-term storage of that carbon, uh, the oak tree uh, has much greater longevity. The pine tree is probably not going to last more than 100 years, and the oak tree may last several hundred years. So this is the other dilemma that we have. Um, we may uh, want to, to plant pines, and in that same time frame, you may be able to plant three generations of pine trees uh, on the time that it takes to, to grow one uh, oak tree uh, to the same size. And in that frame, uh, the pine tree um, wood can be stored in the form of uh, other wood products. And along with the um, uh, multiple use and multiple benefits of a forest, we also have to, to consider. If there were some species, let's say a poplar tree, that you could plant uh, that would be the, the ultimate for uh, the rate at which it captures carbon and the longevity uh, for which it keeps carbon. Um, if we planted every acre in the United States in that tree, uh, <clears throat> then of course we're creating, uh, we're reducing our biodiversity and, uh, and probably harming uh, many other factors that we look for out of our forests. So we're looking at ways that we can couple the carbon benefits uh, with other uses and other um, benefits that the forests provide. So looking at the S-curve, if we start with an area of bare ground and we want to, to plant uh, some trees there, if we plant one tree, the, the curve of that individual tree when was going to start off very slow. Uh, there's not very many roots then, not very many needles uh, to, to add a lot of carbon. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, potentially a lot of competition from other uh, herbaceous weeds and uh, things like that on the site. Over time, as that seedling uh, grows more roots and, uh, and gets more canopy to feed those roots, um, the, the rate of growth will, uh, will increase. So there you have a, an inflection point from the time that you plant the tree to the time that the tree gets uh, five or six years old, uh, the rate of um, carbon sequestration uh, begins to increase um, at a pretty good pace. That, in an open grown tree, that rate will continue to increase for a good while until that tree at first reaches a height, limits the, the height that tree can grow. So once it reaches that height, um, that factor uh, starts to taper down. And then in the case of trees, if it's an open grown tree, uh, it continues to grow. Uh, the canopy spread and diameter uh, will continue uh, to be able to sequester that carbon at a pretty good rate. Um, and then eventually it will just get to an age uh, where that growth rate will taper off and level out uh, to the point that 
uh, the tree is growing very slow and it is taking more energy. Uh, trees uh, also respire, so it's taking more energy to maintain that tree. And then pieces of that tree start to, uh, start to die. So roots start to die, branches uh, start to die. And then you have uh, a, a case where the carbon, uh, it start to be carbon released from that tree. So that curve starts to, to head back down. Um, but it can maintain, some species of trees, say an oak tree, uh, can maintain that uh, decline over uh, many decades. So we go back, uh, that's an individual tree. Uh, in Virginia, however, um, you know, in most of the southeast and, and uh, eastern United States, uh, water is not much of a limiting fact. Uh, if, if, if left alone, even, uh, will start to generate trees. So obviously, if you have a field or an urban area and you just leave it alone, uh, you'll start to see one or two trees pop up because there's not a lot of seed source. Uh, those seeds probably not going to find a great place to land and germinate and it will take decades for that uh, piece of ground to, to uh, regenerate. Whereas uh, in a similar fashion, uh, if you know that there's a piece of land that there's no other use for and you can go in and introduce those seedlings on that uh, piece of land, then you're, you're bringing that carbon sequestration uh, for that otherwise uh, useless piece of land um, up more quickly. In the case of a forested situation where there may be a harvest or a storm event or a fire, um, either in the case of pines and evergreens, seeds may blow in uh, which or be already in the uh, soil duff layer. Um, and I'll refer you to uh, previous videos uh, about regeneration. They don't always regenerate themselves at the uh, density or with the genetics uh, that would maximize carbon um, capture. So back to the S-curve, in this situation you take uh, the S-curve that we described for the individual tree and now you can carry that across the entire acre. So that entire piece of land starts out with young trees, it has a very slow uh, carbon capture rate and then as those trees uh, get to be uh, their vigorous age, so you know 6 to 10 to 20 feet tall, uh, they really start to ramp up. Um, now when, <clears throat> when they grow in a group, when those trees start to grow and, and compete with each other, when their canopies start to overlap with each other, um, then the growth of the individual tree will be reduced. Uh, however, uh, they usually start out at such a density that the growth of that entire acre uh, is still uh, fairly great. Uh, however, you start to introduce mortality then. At year one, uh, there are thousands of, of young plants on the ground uh, per acre. And then as those trees start to compete with each other, by the time you get to year five, you'll have maybe 500 trees per acre. And then by the time you get to year uh, 20, you, you might have uh, 160 uh, trees per acre at that point, because uh, they're larger. And that amount of sunlight can only support so many trees per acre. So in this way, you have this mortality, and that's one of the um, opportunities we have uh, to capture that mortality. Now, some of that mortality uh, may fall over, become the leaf layer and the, um, the what they call coarse woody debris or down woody debris uh, that is in the forest. Um, however, if that woody debris uh, has sufficient moisture and, uh, and those conditions as we have in the southern portion of the United States, uh, then that, that tree will rapidly um, oxidize uh, back into atmospheric carbon uh, through fungi and uh, the other biota which break down wood. Thank you for joining us for 15 Minutes in the Forest. Look forward to future installments where we will look at uh, ways our forest management can be adjusted to sequester more carbon and look for September 17th, 15 minutes in the forest where Jason Fisher will tell us about site preparation for pine.